Hi everyone and welcome to Sci Dance Podcast Season 3. I'm your host Jasmine Cook. This is a dance science podcast presenting discussions with global industry leaders aiming to make research and information more accessible and enhance dancer well-being, health and training at all levels of the sector. New episodes every Monday 6am London time. Thank you so much to The Place for sponsoring today's episode. Located in the heart of London, The Place is a creative powerhouse for dance development that is leading the way in dance training, creation and performance. One of Europe's most exciting, innovative dance spaces, where artists from all over the world come to push creative boundaries, to experiment and to perform outstanding new work. The Place is home to London Contemporary Dance School, a 288-seat theatre, an extensive range of classes, courses, and participatory opportunities for adults and young people, and professional development programmes for artists. Check them out at at the Place London on Instagram, and they'll also be linked in the show notes. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to today's episode of Side Dance Podcast. I'm so excited to be here today with Sonia Rafferty in an episode that has been quite a little while coming. I've been looking to speak to Sonia for a while. I'll let her introduce herself. Um, hi, Sonia. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. If you just tell us a little bit about um, yeah, how you got to where you are now, your journey into dance science, your career, um, a bit about your experience and a bit of background about you. Sure. Um, so I'm here as a dance science practitioner, obviously, um, but I'm also a teacher, a performer, a choreographer, a safe practice consultant, an author, a mentor, a director. So like many people, what we call the portfolio career, you know, I have a bit of everything. Um, I've performed a lot as an independent dancer with different choreographers, um, most recently with Lizzie Q. Ross on site-specific work, and I'm still performing. I'm very grateful to be able to still perform at my age, and so I'm looking forward to that at Easter. Um, I spent seven years with the electric voice dance uh, company La Bouche as a singer and dancer. Uh, La Bouche was at the forefront of sampling in the 80s, and we used voice sounds uh, live on stage to make songs. And we had a, a, a contract, a recording contract with CBS Records, and I did a lot of commercial type stuff, Glastonbury Festival, TV and things. So I learned a lot about uh, you know, being ready to move, ready to dance very quickly from that sort of experience. Um, we, when I graduated from my fourth year of training from what was the advanced performance course at Laban, as it was then, we would have been a master's in performance now, but we didn't have that then, but it was a fourth year of study. Um, I realized I didn't feel quite ready to, to join the big world of, of dancing because at that time, physical theater was becoming quite a big thing in the eighties and it was a different sort of demand for dancers. So I involved myself in things like military fitness and fitness classes with, you know, Reg the Sergeant Major and, and really got myself very fit. Uh, so, and I, and I made my own warm up and cool down routines and I was very strict with myself. And that really helped when I started singing and dancing because the demand was really great. Um, Moving on from performing and everything, I got to the stage where I needed more from my work. I was looking for answers. I had lots of questions about the physicality of dance and, and I wanted to reinforce my interest in fitness and the physiology of the body and the aspects of dance that I didn't know a lot about. I was very confident as a teacher, but I just felt there was some knowledge missing that, that would augment my, my teaching. Um, so I applied for the new, what was the new MSc in Dance Science at Trinity Laban in its first year. And um, so I completed that 18 years ago. Um, following on from that, eight years ago, Maggie Morris and myself co-founded Safe in Dance International with the intention of highlighting the need for informed knowledge uh, and understanding of healthy principles um, across the board for everybody involved in dance. So maybe I'll talk a bit about that later on. So now I've been teaching for well over 35 years and still performing, as I said. And two years ago, I became the programme leader for the new BSc in Dance Science at Trinity Laban. So I've continued to work in creative practice and in dance science. And I, my aim, I call myself the A-frame, I'm very much connected to the two and the two relate to one another. Um, and all the research I've been involved in so far and plan for the future focuses on practice focuses on education and practice, education and training for dancers, 
for all types of practitioners. So I'm very much a, a mixture of dance science creative and, and that's where the strength is, I think. Yeah, definitely. That was going to be, I was going to say that actually, I can really see how your career so far, so from being a dancer and then taking the MSc and then to where you are now, how it all really ties in and it makes, yeah, it makes a lot of sense and gives you a lot of experience, which I'm so excited you're going to share with us today. Um, so to start with, could you tell us about your values and your ethos working in dance science? So what do you believe that dance science should be? That's a huge question to start, I know. Yes, it is. Um, as I've said, it's really important to me that research is relevant and applicable. Yeah, it's not research for research's sake. So working in dance science, it's not just about research, it's about embedding it into everyday dancing. Um, of course, the detailed analysis and the, and the concrete information that we might get from the science aspect is vital. But rather than relying on traditional methods, um, I'd like to see everything being absorbed, really absorbed and, and transferred in a way to, to daily practice. So that it doesn't just remain within the remit of researchers in particular places, but it and maybe just appreciated by a few fewer people. It's a combination of formal research, practitioner wisdom, and simple common sense and experience, each supporting the other. So I don't like to think of dance science as something apart. It's what we know formulated in a different way and we're all investigating the same thing regardless of where we come from so I, I don't want it to be I don't want it to be seen especially because of my background to be seen as something separate from from the practice that we all do yeah definitely and I think I'm not sure if I'll be able to get this across in words but it makes sense in my head so you've gone through the dance side and then come into dance science and there's a really natural sort of flow there which I think helps to illustrate what you're talking about but I suppose research then if researchers are coming into it without their dance background yeah. they, I suppose they have to draw that dance from the dance background section from the dancers does that make sense there has to be a really good link in the community between the dancers and the researchers would you say that was important absolutely the community is what you've what you've just highlighted it we are a community it's not that any one of us knows better than the other is we're all digging it's what I call the dance archaeology. It's we're all digging to unearth the same things. We're just maybe working on it slight, from a slightly different way. But yes, the dance community is a very important part, I think. Dance archaeology, I love that. Um, so like you just said there, translating and distilling research into what we do every day in the studio is perhaps what's one of the most important things about dance science, because that's the reason that I think a lot of researchers do what they do. Um, so how does this happen at the moment? What do you see happening in this area at the moment? And what do you think we could do to improve on it? So this, you've said it, this is a really important point. This is the crux of it. This is the bedrock of it. Um, at Safe and Dance International, CIDI, we say that uh, safe and healthy practice is the outward face of dance science. It's where we can project ourselves. Um, it's where we acknowledge the value that research and the formal interrogation of the art and how we train and how we practice. We acknowledge that's where it is, but and how we can bring the whole thing to the table and enhance the whole approach in a variety of ways. So um, I try not to use now, I used to use the words translating and distilling, but I've recently changed that um, because of a, of a recent presentation that that we did for Healthy Dancer Canada just a few weeks ago. So myself and Maggie Morris um, from CIDI and Andrea Downey from Canada, from Healthy Dancer Canada, we, we invented, we talked about this spiral that we can all connect into. So bringing on the ground experiences, formal research and all the common aims that we have to bring it to the same place, to this spiral, rather than translating down and disseminating down and distilling down because it sort of implies there's a hierarchy. If the researchers are going, right, we need to send this down the tube, we need to send it down into practice. It's not, it's around practice. It's within practice. Um, so the, the people who are doing the doing, doing the dancing, teaching the dancing, um, they know quite a lot. <laughs> they know a lot of things. Uh, and that's what we call practitioner wisdom. And they have real insights into the day-to-day -day difficulties, um, sometimes barriers to implementation of dance science, uh, dance science knowledge and understanding. Um, 
so these experienced practitioners can send things into this spiral that we're all, you know, like a whirlpool. They can send information into the spiral to fund the next sort of stream of research saying, we want to know this. Can you, can you help us find that? Rather than all this, I'm researching that and I'll send it down to you. So it's much more homogenous than, than this, these words distilling and translating because I feel slightly uncomfortable with that now, I think, after, after this long. Um, to be honest, not everybody thinks that dance science improves practice, as we know. Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not that everybody thinks, wow, we need more of this. Some people think it gets in the way and reduces the art in some in some way, reduces the creativity. Maggie and I often start our presentations with, we're not the health and safety police. We're not going to stop you doing the things you want to do. We're just going to support you to do the things you want to do. Um, we just have to find a way to allow everyone to see the value of the scientific principles and what dance science can do to support the practice rather than, you know, flatten it. Um, it's about making dance accessible. It's about promoting healthy work uh, that doesn't overstress dancers of all types. Again, we're not just talking about racehorses, elite dancers. We're not just talking about vocational dancers in training. We're talking about dancers who do dancing for whatever reason. And dance science research can support them as well as the, the high end elite. So we don't want to stress anybody physically, psychologically, and we want to make the dance experience is enjoyable and as fulfilling as, as possible for everyone who dances. So yes, translating and distilling. Hmm, let's think about it slightly differently now, maybe. Yeah, definitely. That's such an interesting concept. And I've always just used that. I'm not sure where I probably first got it from, but I've never actually thought twice about it. That's yeah. so, yeah, I'm definitely going to think about that now for the future because that's so true. It's not it almost shouldn't even need to be translated like the spiral sort of implied yeah. in the first place. It should all come, come together. Oh, I love that. <laughs> For me too. I, I often use those words translating, disseminating, but the, you know, the, with all, a lot of the cultural things that are happening at the moment and, you know, lots of things have been highlighted in the last two years for very many reasons, not least the big thing that we've all experienced, but it, I think it's made people think differently. And I'm certainly, now that I've been involved in dance science for quite a time and safe practice, I'm just starting to see how it can move wider than where, we, where we've always housed it. So yeah, some interesting thoughts coming out. Yeah, definitely. I don't know, I was gonna ask you this at the end, but I think maybe it's helpful to do this now. Could you tell us a little bit more about City? So about yeah. the aims and the ethos of the um, Yeah, just talk about what it does. Cause I hope that most of my listeners will know what it is, but if people don't, maybe just in Absolutely. So CIDI um, is, stands for Safe in Dance International. And uh, Maggie Morris, myself, Maggie Morris, and Matthew Tomkinson founded CIDI uh, in early 2014. So we're seven, eight years in now. Um, Maggie and I had been working in the field of safe and effective practice together in a previous iteration. And when that disappeared, we saw that there was a, very much a need uh, to support and encourage teachers, let's say to refresh or augment or update their knowledge uh, from what they'd always done. Because we have, this knowledge is important. It's, it, it's, it's supportive. It's not that we're telling people you must do it like this now. Um, but a lot of the areas we'll be talking about today, people want to know about and haven't had the chance to study in the way that maybe MSc or BSc graduates have um, so we were trying to look for a place that we could support them to find out information and encourage them to update their practice without feeling defensive or concerned that they didn't know things or they have to change everything they did um, so our mission um, on our website is safe in dance and international believes that it is the right of everyone in, involved in dance to teach study train rehearse and perform in a safe and supportive environment with this in mind, we support, develop, encourage, and endorse the implementation of healthy dance practice worldwide. That's our mission statement. And our strapline is optimizing performance, minimizing injury, enhancing dance. So that's, that's that was our mission, and we've built on the mission. Um, so first, we built a certificate called the Healthy Dance Practice Certificate, which allows teachers to evidence their knowledge and understanding of healthy principles 
and have this practice, this is the crux, have this practice endorsed and credited. So everyone can learn the knowledge. Everybody knows a lot about the, the knowledge that, that, you know, involves, that is involved in safe and healthy practice. But what CIDI does is endorses it and credits it. And we can do this because we are validated by the uh, Council for Dance, Drama and Musical Theatre. So we are endorsed to endorse people's practice. And that's the difference. And we're the only people who do that right now. And so uh, we've now got three certificates, the Healthy Dance Practice Certificate for teachers, the Healthy Dancer Certificate for dancers to show their understanding. And this is what we embed in a lot of undergraduate uh, courses that dancers can get a TL, our BSc graduates do, a BSc two second years do the Healthy Dancer Certificate. So they bring their healthy knowledge together and evidence it and receive a certificate that says they are, they have, you know, a good level of knowledge of how to keep themselves supported. Um, and we also have the preparation for healthy dance certificate, um, which is about the environment and all the boring health and safety stuff like um, insurance policies, environment, heating, lighting, all the things that people actually think is safe practice, but isn't is a tiny little bit of health and safety and that we keep that separate. So we've now got these three certificates that people can do. Uh, we've developed into working with awarding bodies, uh, including the ISTD. We've written and we assess their unit in the diploma in dance education, which focuses on dance, safe dance practice. And we work with them on providing webinars for uh, their tutors to support their teaching in that area. As you can imagine, we've been very busy in the COVID pandemic because people have been panicking about how to do things properly and with the restrictions and everything. Uh, so we've contributed to many of the de debates about masks, about ventilation, things like that, on how to keep our environments as safe as we can during this time. And basically, we have lots of plans for the future, especially now that the importance of um, healthy practice is being recognised more and more and more. And anybody wanting to know more about CIDI can go to our website, safeindanceinternational.com. Yeah, for sure. I'll link it below in the show notes and people can find it straight away. I didn't know that CD worked with the ICD. That's so good. Yeah. Such a good yeah. way to... Yeah, so could you tell us a little bit more about the... I think CD fits into this quite naturally, about the application of dance science to learning and teaching. So I suppose, yeah, I didn't know that you worked with the ICD. That's such a nice a nice link in. But um, yeah, a bit more about how it works with dance science for teachers and what you do in that area. Okay, so we, we have uh, some core principles. Um, our core, as I said, everybody has the knowledge. So we're talking about warm up and cool down, physiology, anatomy, understanding anatomy and alignment, understanding class progression, understanding the safe environment, understanding nutrition and hydration, understanding dancing, dancing bodies. You know, one of your questions was, well, how is it important that students understand their dancing body? Well, it's important for everybody everybody who's working with dancing bodies to understand the dancing body and the dancing mind actually. So what we do is we package all the principles that we think are essential into what we call our core principles. And when people apply for one of our certificates, they evidence their knowledge in each of these uh, areas, each of the core principles, and we give them feedback on how we can see that in their practice. So they will submit, for example, um, a recording of their class and they'll write some questions, some responses to some questions. They'll review their own work. Um, so yeah, that's how CIDI integrates in with the teachers. And obviously we provide webinars on particular topics. On uh, we, we have lots of questions and answers. We've found, especially in the last couple of years, that teachers just want to talk. They want to talk about how they can reinforce their practice, whether they think they're doing the right thing, even though they probably are, they just want confirmation. So talking has been a high feature of our work is just, you know, listening to te teachers, listening to what they want, listening to what the barriers are for implementing safe practice, time, for example, worry that you haven't got the relevant knowledge. So we've been doing a lot of listening. Um, so yeah, that's what, that's how we sort of connect with the teachers. And of course, it's important, as I said, not just through CIDI, but for anybody working with dancing bodies at whatever level to understand what's involved. Otherwise, you know, things are going to happen like injury and 
you know, lack of enjoyment and fatigue and uh, lack of adherence and, you know, dissociating yourself from the dance experience. If it's too painful, if it's too challenging, if it's not challenging enough. So yeah, there's so many things involved. Uh, and that's why it's important for teachers to have, a, to, have to recognize that, that these principles are important in their work for their dancers and for themselves. Mm, absolutely yeah and I want to come on to a little bit in a bit a bit more about practitioner wisdom um but first could I just ask you a little bit about integrating fitness into dance training in different settings so I suppose this is more of a, a practical kind of hands-on perspective for a moment so what does this look like and how can it help our dancers and also I assume you'll cover this as well but why is it so important that we look at this okay so um my some of my own research is in dance fitness, what it means, you know, is it specific, is it different from fitness? And of course, yes, it is. You know, we, we don't want to just copy everything that we've seen before. We want to make it really targeted towards the skills and attributes that dancers need. So we don't waste time so that we can really support them. Um, incorporating fitness into dance training has been around in the dance science research field for quite some time now, and it's still being researched. Um, it's had a lot of research focus and I think pretty much everybody is on board with the notion that a fitter dancer can be a better dancer. We might not be able to prove that, but I think everybody's aware that, you know, having, having a good, um, what's the word, good craft, good, good toolbox yourself um, helps you perform better and, you know, be more creative as well. Um, so what we mean by a fitter dancer is a dancer who is physically and mentally prepared for the demands that their type of dance, whatever that might be, um, their dance activity has on them. So for example, dance can be a way of getting fit for recreational dancers, but now there's an expectation that dancers in vocational training and certainly professionals who are working, you know, across, you know, short-term contracts, that they are, that they should have the physical, not just the technical resources to meet the needs of the art that is con that's constantly changing. Personally, I don't think it's as simple as having a um, incorporating it into dance technique class. I, I just, it's, I've come to the conclusion it's not that simple. I've tried um, incorporating the physical training, the principles into the class itself, but dance class is about learning, about skill learning. It's not just about making the body fit to do this. So I've come to the conclusion that um, there are some things you can do but as it changes the focus of the technique class quite a lot, just focusing on fitness principles or conditioning principles, um, it can take a little bit away from the class. Um, of course, some technique classes, especially in some specific genres, they naturally build the physical attributes within the vocabulary. That's not always the case uh, for a versatile dancer. So when we're talking about the full scope of the components of fitness, that's cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, muscular strength, balance, power, flexibility, rest, and so on. Um, I believe that supplementary activities and education on how to do the supplementary activities can be the most beneficial if you need it in your level of practice. So yeah, if as a professional or vocational dancer, I would say that um, integrating fitness is about supplementary predominantly supplementary work to make sure that we really do support that properly does yeah. that answer your question yeah it does I was really interested actually to hear your thoughts about how it, how you've tried integrating it into class and you don't feel it can be that's yeah an interesting perspective because I've just started my teaching well, I yeah, suppose. some things some things and we say we do we do in you know we have we have things that make the, the cardiovascular system work but as for training the cardiovascular system that's another thing. Do we really do 20, 25 minute sequences nonstop? No, we don't. We always stop because we need to give feedback. We need to give more skills training. We need to observe. So, um, and yeah, do we do three sets of 15 reps of a Brombat more? No, we don't. You know what I mean? It's, I, we, we do, it's obviously we're making dancers stronger and, and, and more technically able in class, but in terms of the conditioning itself, if you take that out, I think supplementary work is absolutely necessary, which puts the onus on education for all dancers and dance teachers who 
who has a responsibility to do what? Instead of dance teachers trying to do everything or have to make them fit better dancers, thinking about their dancing, more creative. He's like, let's just, you know, let's just see what all of us can do together, a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier, I just want to look a bit more at it, about the dancers being aware of how their body works, but not just the dancers, the teachers also being aware of this. Um, and it's something that's important to you, and I think it should be important to everyone who dances. Um, so in a very practical sense, this is needed in class because dancers get corrections and feedback and they need to know how their body works and the teacher needs to be aware of how individual bodies work. Can you tell us a little bit more about this um, and how we can help our dancers to achieve this sense of being aware of their own body? Yeah, um, so as I said, all of us that are involved with dancing bodies need to be aware of how the body works. Otherwise, how can we effectively um, make the gains or the outcomes that we want for all of us uh, and understand the most efficient and the healthiest way to do that. So teachers definitely need to have some knowledge and understanding on helping students um, access the technique for all the dancing bodies. But unless the student themselves um, understands the language, the physical or verbal or other type of language that's being used to communicate the information, then the feedback they're getting in, in class can't be appreciated. It, it's almost like you're not speaking the same language. Um, so that means we have to understand, A, the function of feedback, what methods and strategies we're using, um, which are and aren't helpful for specific groups. Um, if a student isn't able to process or make sense of the information they're getting, then it can't be absorbed. That's why it's really crucial to educate dancers about how the dancing body and mind work and what we're asking of it and why. Then the responsibility for healthy practice becomes shared between the educator and the practitioner and the dancer or the participant. That might not be completely equal because obviously some people have more expertise or experience of certain things, but it certainly increases the chances of the knowledge being utilized if everybody involved in that relationship understands what we're talking about. So really it's about, it's about education. It's about helping dancers, giving dancers that, that safe practice, that dance science knowledge on a certain level that they can, they can really bring into their own work. Yeah, so education I would say is really, really, really important. Not just giving them, not just giving them training, not just making them fitter, but giving them the information that they can put in their toolbox. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think from a teacher's point of view, is that kind of, does it come under cueing, I guess? So if the teacher knows enough about the dancing body to know how to cue it well and how to cue an individual student, is that linked in there as well? Absolutely. But as we know from, uh, as dance science people, we often lie in our cueing. We use imagery in our cueing uh, rather than actually correct anatomical information so if if the classic example is you know a teacher shouting lift the leg from underneath lift the leg from underneath well we we know anatomy wise you cannot you cannot do that it, it the leg does not lift from underneath what we're talking about is imagery find the length in the you know antagonist for example um so if we know more we can we can manipulate our imagery so it doesn't confuse anybody but it can augment the creative the aesthetic the quality of the of the material so again we everything's important i use imagery a lot in my classes but i know not to confuse students by telling them the wrong information anatomically i have to build my images around the correct anatomical information mm -hmm. and sometimes that that works and sometimes it doesn't sometimes the wrong information actually Within, within an image is, is much more useful. So we have, to, we have to be able to make the choice rather than relying just on cueing imagery wise, which we often do, all that metaphorical imagery that the teachers tend to use. Um, and also if we are using anatomical references that we're giving them the correct ones, otherwise squeeze that and squeeze this and hold that isn't gonna cut it really. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? Use your core. If you don't know what your core is, you'll just be squeezing something and you have no idea and it might be completely detrimental. So yeah, we have to be careful about our language cueing and the information we put out. Yeah, so that students can receive it effectively. 
yeah definitely I think yeah like you keep saying education is the most important important part I think similarly I'd like to look at increasing student understanding about well-being so I think that's a big part of it that I feel like it's becoming bigger in dance science I'm not sure I haven't been here that long I'm not sure if it's grown recently or yeah could you just tell us a bit more about about this side of it yeah so firstly we've got to accept that dance science is all about well-being that's the whole purpose of dance science and we can call we can call well-being or dance science lots of different names dance or wellness healthy dance practice dance science well-being they're all the same thing really and we're all contributing to that spiral of well-being um, so it's not something that sits outside of daily practice. That's the key for me. Um, also, well-being isn't simply the absence of ill-being. It's not simply not being injured, not being tired, not being motivated or, or being burnt out. It's about enhancing. Well-being is about enhancing the dance experience, enjoying what you're doing, yeah, getting the most out of it. Uh, and working as close to optimal as possible at any level, uh, however your whatever your practice is. So at Trinity Larburn, um, on all the courses now, and in lots of other training programs across the world, there are modules that support the dancer to learn more about how their bodies and their minds react and respond to dance activity. And we call these well-being or kinesiology or dance science modules and they're all basically the same things as you said education so for example at Trinity Lab and the foundation students will have something called BAM which is body awareness and management the BA ones the BA contemporary dance ones will have PAD physical awareness and development and the BSCs will have dance science technique class where all the principles are incorporated within so we'll look at motor learning in dance technique class. We'll look at um, analysis of performance in dance technique class. We'll look at anatomy and physiology. We'll look at somatics. So we bring everything back within an experiential dance science technique class. So these regular sessions in the curriculum around the world uh, cover the essentials of healthy dancing, which is well-being. So warm up and cool down, anatomy and alignment, training principles, components of fitness, supplementary conditioning, nutrition, hydration, injury management, psychological skills, rest, relaxation. That's what we're educating when we talk about well-being. And at Trinity Lab, we have an introductory week where we do a well-being session, a general well-being. What do you think well-being is? When, when they just come into the program and then next week we have a top and tail. Did you see what happened with your well-being? Did it work? What was difficult? So we actually, you know, really support them at either end, the beginning and after their first term. And then we give them more strategies to help them progress that through the rest of their first year and, and beyond. So we get the students to reflect as well on their knowledge and experience of all these modules and how they can take their new and enhanced knowledge onwards. Uh, and this is even more important post-COVID, if we can say post-COVID, actually, during, within COVID, when, when student resilience has been really tested much more. Um, and it's the same for all of us, really. Uh, it's about filling the toolbox. It's about giving us as much information and resources as possible to stay safe and healthy uh, in our practice. So that's what well-being is for me. It's a mixture of everything. Mm, absolutely yeah so you've spoken quite a lot today and it comes in nicely now I think that's a nice link about the importance of practitioner wisdom so not just researcher wisdom but actually being a practitioner and um, I think it's the importance of lived experience could you tell us a little bit more about this yes um so teachers have been teaching for a long time long before dance science was a thing <laughs> Although the principles have been around, the principles of healthy practice have been around for a long time through the early kinesiology practitioners, quite a long time, you know, 80 odd years. So it's, it's sort of not surprising that there might be an element um, or an impression that dance science is sort of teaching your grandmother to suck eggs, if you know that, if you know that, 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 that saying, that expression. It's basically, well, we know that. You know, so stop telling us how to do what we do. Uh, but now that science is focusing specifically on dance, initially probably led by from the sports world, this dance, dance focused science is really putting a spotlight on how we can look at things in different ways, uh, evaluate the older and newer methods 
of practice and training more methodically. So basically, in terms of practitioner wisdom, not just researcher wisdom, we can all learn from each other, that spiral again. And this questioning that arises from everyone's interrogation of practice can feed back into the spiral that I mentioned earlier, so that we get a complete picture from all the perspectives. So teachers find things out on the ground by doing them, and therefore we can look, we can look at the dance scientists to endorse and support and even fuel our practical knowledges, knowledge. And researchers who are often practitioners themselves, you know, remember a lot of us have been dipped fingers in lots of places. Uh, so the researchers can investigate and feed through the findings to the people who are doing the doing, not down, but through the people who are doing. So everybody wins. So the importance of practitioner wisdom is just the same as the importance of researcher wisdom. And um, with another head on and another sort of research that I'm doing, not completely outside of dance science, but with a different focus with other colleagues, uh, a, a line of research inquiry. We've been examining what we call the embodied bibliography of teachers. So the, the documentation, the evidence isn't quite as obvious um, as it would be in a paper, for example. So the evidence is cited in their experience on their everyday practice, which is classic action research. We've got to find a way to value this type of embodied. It's all in there. I have it. I know how to apply it, but I haven't written about it or I haven't investigated it with tools and measurements and things like that. It, but it's still in, it still exists in here. And we have to agree that that's not any less valid because it hasn't been measured or appreciated within the usual research paradigms. So I'd really like to see research growing to accommodate practitioner wisdom and the embodied bibliography of dancers and teachers. That's such an interesting concept. That's really got me thinking now. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> That's my Monday thoughts sorted. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to ask you about today, Sonia, I mean, I could talk to you all day. There's so many things I'd love to know. But the last sort of main thing I'd love to ask about is the effects of teaching online on student experience. So bearing in mind everything we've said today about city, about safe practice, about well-being, what's kind of the effect of teaching online in COVID been on student experience? Oh, well, that would be a podcast, a couple of hours podcast in its own right. I mean, we're still we're still feeling the effects. We're still feeling the repercussions. Teaching online has affected everybody, not just students. So the teachers have had to adapt and upskill and just bl blow up their practice. I mean, who knew what Zoom was, you know, a year and a half ago? Microsoft Teams, how to, you know, how to teach a gallery of 40 people that big a dance class I mean blown our minds really um so it's affected everybody and the effects on the pandemic of on everyone's uh, perspective lots of research is emerging including from us at Trinity Lab and we've got we've got some information coming out um so there's obvious things from the lack of contact the lack of touch and still that's debatable should we shouldn't we and we know that's one of our primary tools for you mentioned it connection and feedback and dancers if you can't touch them dancers have to understand how to do it themselves with you sort of doing this and and, and our verbal skills have had to become much more acute because you have to explain instead of just relying on your instinct and a, and a soft touch to fit to feedback and augment alignment and also not being able to demonstrate full out and and so the students can appreciate the quality as well as the technical aspects of your work completely different way of doing things and um yes it's caused a lot of stress um working in a home environment that might be a quarter inch or, or standing on your bed to dance you know it's it's just affected us in lots of ways the home environment might not allow you to embody the dance properly um mental stress uncertainty resilience being tested and diminished, concerns over lack of fitness. And even now that we're back in the studio, because we sort of are, um, emotions are ranging from excitement to trepidation. We still have concerns about being together, but we're still excited about being together. It's a huge area. The repercussions, as I said, are, are being felt by all and may have longer lasting effects and more research may actually support us should anything like this happen again or it might actually feed into our 
knowledge about dance practice in a completely different way than we expected. As in, how do we transfer, how do that word again, how do we communicate if we can't communicate in the way we have done for so long? So yeah, I'll have to leave it there because it's huge, it's massive, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something to think about. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I think we've covered lots today and that's definitely a really great introduction as well to City if people haven't heard of it before. So I'll absolutely link that below in the show notes so that people can find it. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or discuss today? No, uh, just that I'll be, um, you've got great people on your podcast. You've got some amazing uh, experts and a lot of information and also the, the way that you put them together gives different perspectives. So obviously I'm, I'm telling all my students to listen to your podcasts and, and to, um, I think it's great that you're, it's again, making things accessible in a way that, you know, that, we, we never used to it's not a lecture it's a sharing of expertise and information and needs so it's um yeah i would encourage everybody to have a good old listen and i will be doing that to to pass on your podcast thank you that means a lot thank you so much Sonia. have a great rest of your day bye thank you thanks so much for listening tune in again next monday and in the meantime follow at side dance podcast on instagram it would also be so appreciated if you have a moment, if you could please rate and review on Apple to help the podcast grow. Bye.